Now, as the Tripartite Committee on New National Minimum Wage concludes its public hearing in the six geopolitical zones of Nigeria, the federal government is considering sanctioning states that are reluctant to implement the new minimum wage. The sanction was part of the recommendations by the stakeholders who attended the public hearing. Although the recommended sanctions remain sketchy, it was gathered that those states may not benefit from federal government grants. It is expected that the old minimum wage of 30,000 naira per month will cease to be effective on March 31st for a new rate to take effect, which President Bola Ahmed Tinubu may announce on May 1st, 2024. Now, over 15 states have not been paying the current 30,000 naira minimum wage implemented since 2019. To discuss this, I'm joined by business and social policy analyst Kenneth Ikenwa. Hello, Kenneth. Thank you so much for joining me. Good afternoon, Dushan. Thanks for having me on. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure. So, uh, Kenneth, are you of the opinion that the states lagging behind, you know, in the payment of the minimum wage should be sanctioned as proposed by the Tripartite Committee on Minimum Wage? Well, uh, in answering that question, uh, we have to take a look at what the provision of the law actually makes. Because I think that uh, to start talking about sanctioning states uh, at this point in time, we would not also be accommodating the economic realities that most states have faced in the last two to three years, where we've experienced a depression and where we've experienced a recession. But uh, the issue of the new minimum wage is bullish. So I'd like to take uh, the bull by the horn uh, and hold the two horns. The first will be to actually look at the new minimum wage and uh, to look at the possibility of sanctions and why most states have not been able to pay. The other would be the prescriptive, which is, um, from my own point of view, what I will prescribe should be the range of the new minimum wage, which we're expecting to be announced uh, on May 1st. So let's come to the first one. One, I'm surprised that most states are not able to pay this, uh, even in 2024, uh, particularly my state's Delta and Bayelsa, because these are uh, two oil-producing states, and these are uh, states that also earn from 13% der derivation, and one would have we expected that they should be able to pay the minimum wage of 30000 It's quite disappointing. But uh, we look at the issues and look at the law. Um, I do not know how the federal government will go about uh, sanctioning these states. I think the best that the federal government could do is to maybe use the carrot and stick approach. And the other thing that the federal government could also do is to withdraw the collateral signatory for some of these subnationals, by that I mean states, especially when they go outside the shores of Nigeria to look for loans, uh, to look for aid, to actually shore up their budgets and implement uh, project, uh, uh, implement the projects that they want to do, or uh, want to execute in their states. So um, it is uh, something that the federal government should actually take by the horn, like I'm suggesting I'm doing right now. I see no reason why, particularly with the removal of subsidy, it is obvious, like the president said in the last couple of one or two weeks ago, that the revenue has increased and the states, from what we see on a monthly allocation basis, are getting more monies into their accounts from the FAC allocation. Mm. So we need to now hold some of these states and the governors of these states to the jugular and ask them what they are doing with the excess that is coming in from crude, excess that is coming in from the savings that have been made from subsidies. Uh, my position is that the sanctions are, are, are welcome okay. and that those states in Nigeria, as we speak, should have an excuse for not meeting up with at least 30 percent minimum wage. All right. Uh, Before we I... have... Now, now, talking about the excuse be... for not being able to meet up, you know, uh, the payment of these minimum wage, these particular states actually cited low revenue as a factor or even a challenge for their inability to implement even the 30,000 naira minimum wage. But in your honest opinion, is this an excuse? Well, it is not an excuse. In fact, it, it, it is utterly bemusing, but beyond being bemusing, we mm. should look at it from a bigger picture. This uh, brings to the, for the challenges of federalism. This brings to the question whether we are actually practicing the federalism that the Constitution says we should practice. Now, for me, I see it as a challenge for each state, because what most states actually do is that they are not creative enough to generate internal, internal generated revenue for themselves to meet up with their, um, the, the, the aspects of, 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 of their commitments to, to, to their employees or to members of that state that are employed by the state are to pay their salaries. 
So what this means is that most states actually just wait for allocation. Most governors don't even stay in their state. They stay in Abuja, waiting for allocation, and then going back to disposal allocation. So it, it, it is a problem that points to a bigger problem. It is something that should bring us to a point of convergence, not divergence, mm. and to ensure mm. and to give a directive and to hold the states and the governors to the juggler and ask them to start being creative. Most of these states are endowed with humongous mineral resources and natural human endowment that they are not taking advantage of. So this is the time to look inwards. This is the time to stop, uh, you know, torpedoing uh, at that point of inflection, have some reflection, assessing how they can now generate more revenue and meet their commitments going forward. Okay, Aside from the fact that they are, they are now even getting much more from the federal account. All right, now, still Abuja. talking about, you know, uh, this, uh, them not being able to, you know, generate a revenue uh, from low revenue and upward review of the minimum wage and a possible sanction, uh, you know, of those states, you know, which might mean they're not even likely to benefit from a federal government grants, right? How do you think that these sanctions might affect the financial stability of these non-compliant states? Because some have actually said that rather than punish them, on the contrary, uh, there should be measures in place to support these states, you know, that are struggling to implement the minimum wage, especially considering the disparity, you know, in revenue among states uh, so as to ensure uniform implementation of the minimum wage. All right, Dushan, some of us are out there and we're actively reading and, you know, monitoring what is actually happening in most of these states. And I can tell you and beat my chest, you know, to this point, that most of these states have no excuse for not being able to meet up with paying uh, the minimum wage. Especially considering the fact, I'm saying this for the third time, that revenues allocated to these states have improved over time. Mm. Now, will it, what will be the implications of actually sanctioning them? I think it will be time for most of these states to start looking inwards. The implication will actually be that most of these states will embark on the retrenchment of staff, which will mean that most staff in some of these states will have to lose their jobs under the guise and under the pretense that they don't have enough money to pay uh, these uh, this, this members of staff. But um, there could be some form of palliative that could be put in place. Uh, and, and, and rewards and compensation in forms of salaries and minimum wage should not just be tied to the figures that we actually look at, you know, uh, as prescribed by the law. These states can look at a modular approach to paying the minimum wage or to compensating their staff by introducing some other fringe benefits, health management uh, benefits, and some other benefits, retirement benefits, and also, you know, maybe engaging some of these minimum staff that may be willing to retire at, at an early age so that they can be paid their gratuity and go on to do something more enterprising with whatever they earn in gratuity. So I do not think there's any cause for any alarm. It is um, a cause for us to look at the bigger picture, to actually signal to the states and signal to individuals that the time uh, for us to be quite enterprising in all that we do at the individual level, at the national level, and at the state level is now. This is the time for more creativity. Uh, in, uh, across the nooks and crannies of the entire federation. All right, well, just before I let you go, Kenneth, uh, now uh, there's this section that, you know, a lot of people seem to, you know, uh, avoid, and that's the private sector. How will the federal government ensure that the private sector employers also comply with the minimum wage? Well, I don't think the, the private sector is having too much of a problem with compliance with the minimum wage, except, of course, for some uh, of the organizations that are not being covered uh, by maybe pension allocation and, and that are not being monitored by the relevant regulatory authorities. Now, what this means is that most of the regulatory authorities have to come on board, particularly the, the pensions, uh, the PENCOM, the Pension Commission, and the Corporate Affairs Commission to help the government monitor uh, what these uh, companies are doing. And also, there has to be employee activism, a high degree of employee activism, so that the employees themselves can start getting around and can start joining unions so that they can also report their employers, you know, to the government to say the government is not actually meeting up with the minimum wage. But, but some of these but, uh, private employers don't even allow their employees to join these, uh, what do you call it, uh, the unions? That, again, is another problem. This is a democracy, and the democracy, one of the principal pivots of democracy, is a freedom of association. So I am happy that we are at this junction in our point of trying to get to a democratic territory. This will now mean that all hands have to be on deck, and people should allow uh, members, employers should allow their employees to become members of relevant unions that are, are, are peculiar or particular to their kind of business. 
But for me, I think the major challenge, away from all the, all the discourse so far, should be what should be the prescribed minimum wage. Now, the, the, the NLC has prescribed one million. I think that is unrealistic. At the point in time they prescribed 200,000, I also think that may not be possible, considering the economic realities that we're facing and the fact that we're just recovering from all fronts economically. So if you ask me, when you look at the basic staple food of Nigerians, which is bread, uh, an average loaf of bread in Lagos, for instance, goes for about 1,000 naira. And the family of four would need about two loaves of bread to satisfy those uh, families every day in Nigeria. That's 2,000. By 30 days, that's 60,000. So a minimum wage of 60,000 doesn't definitely work for Nigerians now. And if the fuel of uh, the price of petrol has gone up by 200%, I would expect that a new range of minimum wage should also go up between 200 and 300%. So I am hopeful that on May 1st, we will be expecting the President of the Federal Republic to announce nothing less than 90,000 as minimum wage for every Nigerian going forward. I repeat, 90,000 should be the minimum wage going forward. All right, well, thank you so much, business and social policy analyst Kenneth Kenwa, for joining me and speaking on this. Thanks for having me on. Shalom. You're